Hi, happy Friday, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And thanks for joining us for ODI Fridays, the final one for 2020. I'm Hannah Folds, and I'm the Head of Marketing and Membership at the Open Data Institute. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Sophie Walker, at COO at Disposal, an organisation that creates tools to empower waste producers and waste managers to understand their legal ob obligations and make better decisions about where their waste ends up moving us towards a more cleaner, more transparent, and more accountable sector. In this talk, Sophie will lift the lid, or should we say dustbin lid, uh, you can blame Sophie for that joke, on the murky world of waste data and explore the opportunities that are on the horizon for an industry on the cusp of digital transformation. Just a bit of house, housekeeping before I hand over to Sophie. Uh, our fantastic digital producer, uh, Freya, will be adding this talk to YouTube once it's over. So we'll be recording it. Uh, please ensure your cameras and your mics are turned off for the duration of the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I hope you do have some questions, then please add them throughout the talk. So as, as the talk's going on to our chat function and I'll read them out for you or you can read them out yourself. I'll give you the choice and we'll do that at the end. So please reserve your, your questions till the end. Um, and if you could also introduce who you are and where you're from in, in, in the question, uh, we'd really appreciate that too. Uh, over to you, uh, Sophie. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, let me get going. Right. Okay, so I'm hoping you can all see that. Do shout if you can't. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm Sophie, I'm the COO and co-founder of Disposal, who along with our sister social enterprise, Your Disposal, is on a mission to empower people to know what happens to their waste and make better decisions around it by bringing transparency and accountability to the waste supply chain. So waste is something that every single one of us creates, but very few of us understand. And for millions of us, once we discard something into the bin, we lose all connection to it. It loses its identity, its value, and we lose visibility of where it goes. And this lack of visibility, identity and value erodes our sense of responsibility and our ability to enact change. And the current system prevents us and those along the waste supply chain from being truly accountable to the fate of the valuable resources that we throw away. <clears throat> uh, the Attenborough effect has led to a massive public backlash against plastics um, and the uncomfortable truth that our waste often ends up where it shouldn't. One of the reasons for that is that these complex opaque waste supply chains which span the globe are still primarily paper-based. Um, DEFRA, uh, the Department for Education, uh, no, not Education, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, a uh, review into serious and organised crime in the industry, found that the lack of digital record keeping is frequently explo exploited by organised criminals as it provides ample opportunity to hide evidence of the systematic mishandling of waste. Sadly, the current system also allows, and I'd argue even encourages, legitimate operators to make economically profitable decisions at the expense of the environment. It's how you end up with recycling from our local authorities being found in dumps in the Malaysian jungle. Um, <clears throat> and it's also how you end up with the NHS in a national scandal after one of its clinical waste contractors was found to be stockpiling body parts along with other biological and clinical waste in unrefrigerated warehouses after its disposal routes were insufficient. Regulators do not have the resources to properly enforce compliance or investigate breaches um, and a system we think that allows waste producers to take control of these supply chains and make the best choices for their waste and spot issues early would reduce the risks on waste producers, lead to cost savings and alleviate some of the pressures on the regulators. So our vision is for a world in which the materials that flow through our economies as waste are instead recognised and treated like the valuable resources that they are. Until we do that, we can't hope to adopt a circular economy, but to enable that, we need to understand that these materials, like once they're designated as waste, what happens to them? And for that, we need much better data. Like I said, waste supply chains are complex with whole ecosystems of actors, and these are complex problems that require systems thinking and holistic solutions. So we've approached these uh, from a kind of really systemic perspective if we can. So we've looked for collaborators and engaged with as many stakeholders as possible. And we've really worked hard to try and build the credibility and kind of trust in our brand. 
And despite being a small and relatively young company, we have cultivated impressive networks and seized opportunities that we've been presented with and built a whole suite of digital tools for this purpose. For us, the common thread is compliance and what we refer to as passive compliance. We want to make doing the right thing with waste the easiest thing. Uh, and it, it's working, it seems. Uh, so our tools are used by thousands of people every week. Our directory helps tens of thousands of people find licensed waste services every month. Uh, and our waste thesaurus has been used in almost every country on the planet, which I find astounding. <laughs> Uh, we can't tackle all of these problems on our own, especially as we're so small, but our collaborative approach has garnered support from across sectors and we're finding that more and more organisations are now coming to us to help them to digitalise their processes. So resource efficiency has the potential to achieve huge cuts to our carbon budget, as shown in this chart from the Green Alliance, but we need to start gathering the data on all the stuff that's handled by the waste industry so that we know what it is, how much there is, who's doing what with it, um, and where it is. <clears throat> Once we start understanding that, then much of this waste can begin to be treated like resources instead. Because a bin full of nondescript rubbish is a burden. Most of our waste is a burden. It costs us money to get rid of, and that is true right down the line. So waste producers, carriers, processing facilities, and end destinations. Criminals are able to make money by taking the burden off someone uh, and getting paid for it, uh, and then not paying for their part of it down the chain by dumping it or burning it or passing it off as something else. And that's how they make their money. If waste wasn't a burden, but was in fact dealt with as a resource, then there'd be no value in dumping or burning it. I mean, I'm sure criminals would still find an angle, but I think you'd stop the dumping and burning on the whole. And digital systems make it much easier to gather, store, analyze and share data, but really we need to go beyond simply digitizing our current processes and instead actually really look at a digital transformation and build the foundation that we need to realize a circular economy. So the three components that we think that are critical to kind of enabling a digital transformation of the whole waste industry and that will then benefit like kind of all the actors in it and the planet um, maybe not all the actors hopefully not the criminals but I think that's okay. Um, but yeah, so these are the three things. So as I mentioned already, the industry is an ecosystem because of the variety of waste producers and the complexity of waste management needs. And these supply chains are intricate and interconnected. And generally tweaking one bit of the system has knock on effects. So if we want to create real change, we need to ensure that whatever solutions that we're coming up with are compatible and complementary, and that they work for everyone from family run skip companies to multinational waste companies and from a hairdresser to a global manufacturer um, and from householders to regulators so everyone the second thing that we think is really critical is that this digital transformation needs to be built on open principles open standards for data make it easier for people and organizations to public uh, public publish access share and use better quality data and a good data standard becomes invisible but critical and allows things to kind of just work <clears throat> like knowing that you can take an electrical item and plug it into any socket open data and standards also enable competition by allowing anyone to know the rules of the game and that opens the door to innovation and to be clear open data does not mean putting every bit of somebody's data out for everyone to see so I think you only need to look at things like open banking to see that open data can be done in a way that protects privacy and security while enabling interoperability and linking of that data. By promoting open principles from the start for the waste industry, we think that we can avoid going down the sort of monop monopolistic route that we've seen in other sectors and instead benefit from a thriving ecosystem of businesses and innovation. And this route also increases transparency and accountability and frankly we really need that in the fight against waste crime and then the third thing which i've already touched on is our idea around passive compliance we must make it easy for people to do the thing we want them to do with their waste rather than relying on them like wanting to make the right choice or having the knowledge and the know-how to know what the right choice is because let's face it most people don't know what their legal obligations to waste are um, 
And so, yeah, as we did a survey uh, for our tip of the Binberg report and we commissioned um, some research by YouGov in Greater Manchester, which showed that 49% of adults didn't know that waste removal services needed to be licensed. <clears throat> and in a study by the Right Waste, Right Place campaign, even businesses were unaware of their duty of care, with 48% of SMEs not knowing where their waste goes once it leaves their premises. But the thing is, is even if you do know that you need to check and even if you know that you could go onto the Environment Agency's public registers website to check it, it can be a really tiresome and convoluted task. Another part of the research that we did in Greater Manchester was to try to verify the license information on adverts in local papers offering rubbish removal services. Uh, and of the 34 adverts that we found, um, we could only verify three of them from the ads. And then we rang the rest up and we were able to verify one more. Uh, and then the other 30, um, we couldn't verify. Um, a number of them did give us valid license details, but when we went online and looked at them, it was clear that it wasn't for that particular operator. Uh, and things like uh, five of them, uh, this happened on a number of occasions where five of them gave us the same license number for a kind of a sole trader, which clearly that's not what was going on there. So just to show that even if you're asking for that information, it's really hard to kind of make sure that you're getting the valid information you need. <clears throat> and another example of this difficulty that I was talking about. So when you're trying to carry out basic checks on site permits, for example, of a waste site, um, those permits aren't updated when they change hands. So a company buys a site and they've, you know, new company name, but the license and the permit is still under the old company's name. So how are you supposed to know that that's that company? Um, and quite often waste operators don't provide their full permit to people when they ask for it. They just get the kind of front page or what's called the variation. And you can't then see the information that you actually need. Uh, and sadly, you can't find that information out on the EA public registers either. There's also a lot of uh, a lack of standardization when it comes to kind of permits and licenses. So um, as you can see from the top part of this slide, uh, the same company's name can be recorded in a multitude of different ways. Um, and addresses uh, often don't seem to conform to my idea of a normal address standard. Um, and like some of the examples on this slide where it's just not known. <laughs> right? um, so it does make it really difficult for people to actually kind of verify the information that's there. And that just makes it more complicated and a kind of a barrier to people being able to check. And these sort of discrepancies also are kind of leave an opening for unscrupulous operators to take advantage of it. And frankly, just doing the right thing shouldn't be this hard because most people want convenience, don't they? When I speak to a lot of people in the industry, in the waste industry, about drivers for waste crime, the most often thing that people tell me is that it's people use a criminal because it's cheaper but I don't think that's actually true a lot of the time um, because there's a lot of research that shows that price isn't the most important factor for people when they make a decision um, again as part of our tip of the Bimberg research we asked 500 residents about how important certain factors were when choosing a rubbish clearance service and more respondents chose convenience and good availability as being very important than low price as being very important and this appetite for convenience above cost is a wider trend. Um, an annual survey of 2000 UK shoppers found 45% of consumers are still more likely to abandon their purchase due to a lack of convenient delivery options, not a lack of free ones. Um, or there was also a National Retail Federation survey in January of this year, which found 93% are more likely to choose a retailer based on convenience. Uh, and that 40% said that convenience was the most important thing at the research or start of their purchasing journey. Which I think goes a long way to explain why householders would choose a paid for service, even if their council offers a free collection, which a lot of councils do, because sadly, a lot of the council collections aren't very convenient. And it's also why if someone pops off on someone's Facebook page saying that they'll take away their junk tomorrow for 30 quid, it's a pretty easy sell. We conducted another survey um, of executives in the facilities management sector across the UK. And I think what's interesting is the top three statistics, they tell you that waste is really important to them and to their clients. Uh, and that there's potentially a very high cost, both reputational and financial to getting it wrong. But the thing that really blows my mind with this is despite that, 94% of them rely on their waste contractors to keep them compliant. 
which perfectly backs up the right waste, right place research that SMEs think that they're meeting their duty of care, but they don't know where their waste goes once it's taken away from their premises. And, you know, from the headlines that I showed you earlier, it's clear that people aren't always doing the right thing with it when they take it away from your premises. So, but given the difficulty of actually checking on waste supply chains, I don't think it's that surprising that many organisations take the documents that are handed to them by their waste contractor and file them away dutifully thinking, oh yes, I've got all these documents, great, without examining them or independently verifying them or figuring out whether they've been handed the right things, because actually doing that is really hard. And they do have a legal duty of care to do that, but the risk of not meeting that doesn't outweigh the effort. And that shifts all of the burden of enforcement to regulation and regulators, which I said you know, at the start, just don't have the resources for it. I think it'd be so much more efficient to have the kind of the power in the hands of the waste producers to have full oversight of their compliance. And that's what we're trying to do. So technology can make compliance tasks simpler, quicker and more reliable. Um, and at Disposal, we've built a whole suite of digital tools to help people with these tasks. We have a directory of um, licensed waste services in England, and we're able to do this because the Environment Agency has developed an open API of their public registers. Um, and we think that our our version is more user friendly and, and kind of nice to use. And the EA data team have said that it's exactly the sort of thing that they wanted to see um, used with that kind of infrastructure that they'd built. And we are hoping to extend this to the rest of the UK um, because at the moment it only covers England because the Environment Agency only has jurisdiction over England, um, but we're not there yet. Um, we're also, um, I mean, so we're in conversations with the other with the other regulators from the other countries, but they, do, they don't have digital systems properly for it yet. So that's why we're not able to do that at this moment. Um, we've also linked the directory to our waste thesaurus, which is our most popular tool, like I said earlier. Um, and so what we've done is we've linked tens of thousands of keywords to the 842 EWC code. So that's the European waste catalog codes. And the idea is it should make waste classification easier for people. So this is an openly available tool um, and yeah, it's used all over the world. And I'd love to tell you that it's like got some snazzy AI or machine learning in it, but um, the truth is there's just not enough data for that yet. So it's just, just Tom, Tom working away, making it better every day. Um, and what we'd hope to do actually was link the thesaurus to the site permits that I was mentioning earlier so that actually you could search for a specific waste type and find sites that were licensed to deal with it. Unfortunately, uh, that information isn't digital yet, um, and I believe that the EA are working on it, which is great, um, but until they do, we kind of have to rely on waste companies uploading that information um, to disposal, and then you're able to kind of access it. Um, another tool that we've built is our peace of mind dashboard, uh, which makes it easy and quick for kind of waste producers, waste managers, or brokers to kind of manage their waste supply chain compliance, because almost every single like waste compliance manager that we've ever spoken to says that they do it really manually. So they have loads of spreadsheets and calendar notifications and folders full of documents. And despite best intentions, um, things get missed because there's just so much of it to kind of keep on top of. So what we've done is kind of tried to automate as much of that as possible. So we link to the um, EA API so that the information about licenses and permits is, is live. Um, and then we ask um, waste companies to add additional information so they can put their insurances and um, like uh, accreditations, ISO 14001, for example. Um, and all of that information is stored in one place and you're kind of notified when those things are going to expire. The other thing about it is that often when people do compliance checks, they tend to do them either at the sort of procurement stage or maybe during an annual review or an audit or something like that, but, um, but not really much in between. And so again, if you're not keeping track of people, it's very easy for people to kind of behave or operate poorly in between. And so the idea with this is it gives you a sort of real time view of what's going on. Um, and I think one of the good things that surprisingly has come out of this rather terrible year is that I think a lot of, um, people have kind of realized how useful tech is when you're dealing with kind of disparate working people, you know, people working from home and all of that kind of stuff. And so um, we've kind of seen a real um, increase in interest in these tools that allow people to kind of do this job from wherever they are. 
Um, and then, the, I mean, yeah, COVID's, COVID's been a weirdly good year for us in terms of our business, um, because actually what we also saw was that the disruptions that it caused to council recycling centre operations led to a more than 600% growth in traffic to our directory, um, the pages specifically that are on um, household waste recycling sites with residents kind of looking for information on that. Uh, and we have a like a contact us form and a chat function on our site and we were getting a lot of messages from people asking pretty basic questions around, you know, are you open and are there any new rules that I need to follow and do I need to get a permit or are you doing the alternate number plate system and all that sort of stuff. And being the helpful people that we are, we were trying to find that information out for them. And honestly, it was so hard. Each council had a different kind of way of approaching it and different systems in place and then different ways of communicating those things and searching around for that information for these people who are contacting us. It, it just became incredibly clear to me why people were coming to us and, you know, just desperately trying to find help from anyone because it was so hard to find easily online and and even like national services like recycle now um which have information about recycling kind of services for the whole country had messages on just sort of saying check with your local council because their stuff's only updated once a year generally so for us like i said making things easy is really important and clearly this was not being easy for people and so um we thought that developing open data standards and an open data set of this information would make it a lot easier for both the local authorities to communicate this information with the public and for the public to find this information. And so at the start of the year, we put in a, a funding bid to the ODI um, and I'm delighted to say that we were successful. So we're working with Open Data Manchester to develop an open data standard of information around council waste and recycling services and to create a prototype open data set of that of that information um, because it is an open data standard we're working with as many people who are interested in it as possible so we've had a load of workshops um, in the summer which were really well attended by a really broad range of stakeholders which was brilliant um, and we'll be having more uh, in the new year if you're interested please do get in touch with us um, it's been really kind of amazing actually seeing all the different ways that people can see the value in what we're doing with this. So we've had some really interesting conversations already with um, OpenStreetMap about adding, adding this data to, to that, which is brilliant. Um, and also we're having some really interesting conversations with OPRL, which is the OnPack recycling label about ways of tying this data together with the information that consumers actually see on the, on the packaging of the products that they buy. So it's kind of it's grown a lot out of what we initially kind of thought it would be which is brilliant and I think goes to show that there's real a need for it and people can really see the kind of the value in it so um yeah so please do get in touch if that sounds like it's something that you're interested in um so yeah so that's me thank you very much for listening to me thank you ODI for inviting me and I am going to stop sharing now Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, we're going to move over to some questions now. So I'm going to kick us off with one, but I can see some questions coming into the chat function. So if people can keep adding theirs and I will come to you uh, after this first one. So Sophie, I'm, what I'm quite interested in is, is the, the team behind all this, your team, and the mixture of skills and backgrounds that they have, the, the kind of expertise that comes together to create a service like this or a function like this. Okay, uh, that's a great question and one I don't think I've ever been asked before. So we have a really, um, I think we've got a really interesting team. So the, there is five of us now. Um, we have uh, me, my background is in food supply chain and I always kind of thought that that wasn't particularly relevant when I started in this, but kind of everything's about supply chains actually, isn't it? So there's a lot of stuff that I find that is actually, um, you know, really useful transferable skills and kind of knowledge. Um, Tom, um, our CEO and my co-founder um his background is from the waste industry he worked in the waste industry for a number of years both with local authorities and with um and with a, a private company um and it, it was it was his idea tom and i were cycling around uh, north america um i was having a lovely time looking at the scenery and tom missed his office job uh, and came up with the idea for disposal uh, at that point and uh, and yeah, as in, so he's always been really interested in tech, but he's not a, a techie person. Um, he has 
also done some stints with the NHS um, doing data um, analyst kind of roles. And so he's, yeah, he's good with the data and he, he kind of understands tech, although he's not a developer. We have two developers now, which is very exciting. Um, we've had George just with us since uh, early 2018. Um, and Annika has just joined us about a month ago. Um, and um, they make everything happen, is brilliant. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we've got a commercial director um, who joined us about a year ago. And um, frankly, Tom and I are terrible salespeople. Um, and, um, uh, and yeah, getting Alexa on board has been brilliant because she is actually able to kind of bring that sort of commercial acumen. So it, we're a really mixed bunch um, in terms of our kind of backgrounds and experience. Alexa used to be a solicitor for many years. Um, like, yeah, I gave you Tom's background. We got Georgia straight out of university, lucky us. Um, and Annika's background's in finance, but now, now she's a developer. So yeah, we're a, we're a mixed bag. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Sophie. That's interesting. <laughs> um, I've got a question from uh, Jez Nicholson. Jez, I don't know if you want, you've got two here. Um, you're welcome to ask both of them. I don't know if you want to ask them or you want me to. If there's, if there's a silence, I will, I will do it. <laughs> I, th I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an affirmative. Um, so Jez asks, does, did the EA APIs provide everything you needed? Or did you have to ask them to amend it? And did they? So, uh, well, there's always more stuff we'd like on it. Like I was saying about the permit details is the main thing that's missing that we desperately want um, and that they are working on. Um, I think that in terms of the basic information, it, it's got what, what we need. Um, and, you know, we've worked really closely with them as in we've, you know, we've told them what we're doing right from the start. And I think that's been really beneficial to kind of have that relationship with them. Um, we have had problems where they've amended stuff the way that they, I think they changed the way that they do the location um, identifiers and that caused us a whole heap of problems. Um, and we, you know, we kind of flagged that up and unfortunately they didn't tell us in advance, but yeah, so I think, it's pretty good um, and they have been very kind of responsive to stuff where we've asked it about it when they're able to but like say putting all the permit information into digital form is a, a big job that you know we know that they can't just kind of switch switch a switch on so um yeah that sort of answers it but um, I'm not the technical person so I can't answer any better than that I don't think Jess has a follow-up question about the um, environment agency again. So um, Jess says, I think this is a great example of private business providing the last mile interface between government and the general public. Did you get support and encouragement from the environment agency? Yeah, so like I said, we, we as soon as, so the reason it came about was Tom actually uh, wanted to get a list of all of the um, licensed sites in the country. And he sent a FOI request to them and uh, got a reply back saying, we're not doing that, use our API. So I was like, oh my God, that's so much better. <laughs> um, and so we then contacted them and said, oh no, this is amazing. This, can we talk to you about what we want to do with it and make sure that like we're using it in a, a way that we're not gonna get into trouble for and that you know it's all all right and everything. And so um, we had meetings with them right at the start and yeah, they were really supportive, really helpful. Uh, and I know that um, Chris Jarvis like puts us on <laughs> on his talks when he's going around and telling people about what their, what their data stuff gets used for. So it's nice to be able to provide them, you know, a use case for something that, yeah, we literally wouldn't be able to do what we do without it. So they've been great. Thank you. Next question is from Neil. Uh, Neil, uh, did you want to ask your own question? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah, I must say, um, firstly, thanks for this. This is really kind of inspiring, having spent part of last week getting quite depressed about recycling for various <laughs> things I was researching. Um, and the supply chain management element of it is, is a really interesting thing. And also, um, so I, I, the kind of key question I had was not to dwell on the tech side of things. But I was just fascinated to know how you kind of have been working with people um, to try and get all this, you know, this sectorial buy-in um, at that one level. And then maybe dip into the tech a little bit if you can, just, exp you know, roughly how you've been exchanging data with people. Sure. So um, it's been really slow. It's the main thing I'd say. So uh, getting 
getting people on board is hard um especially i think for us we've we've realized that we've got a kind of a number of um elements in which we have to do sort of education and awareness raising so from a kind of public perspective the fact that hardly anybody knows anything means we've got a big piece in terms of trying to educate people on that and and with businesses as well in terms of waste producing businesses when it comes to waste management companies um the waste sector is really digitally pretty immature and so actually trying to explain to them how tech can be useful and also getting over the barrier of the fact that a lot of them have had experience with tech but it is atrocious and when you see it you just think oh my gosh I know why you wouldn't want to use a new system because you think it's going to make your life harder not better so it's been a bit of an uphill struggle in that sense but I think what we've done which I think is a little bit unusual in terms of looking at other startups and stuff that I've seen is that right from the start we've tried to get involved with as many things as we possibly can so you know we joined CIWM which is the Chartered Institute of Waste Management we um, were members of the Resource Association and that got us in a meeting rooms with people from like um, DS Smith and Nova, you know so massive recycling um, companies and things like that and understanding the sort of the structure of the industry and the policies and and how people operate um, because we we just knew that although Tom's got experience in the sector that you know we certainly didn't know everything and we needed to kind of gather as much information as possible I think people can see that we genuinely care about it and that we really want to solve the problems and so from a kind of um, from a sort of I don't know how to put it not ivory tower but the sort of the the movers and shakers in the industry get I think what we're we're trying to do getting people on the ground to adopt it is the really really slow bit um and I can't tell you how we've solved that because we're still solving it it's it's um it's 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 talking to people it's you know demoing them what we've built it's um it's trying to show them how it actually helps and it, it's tricky because in terms of waste companies trying to make sure that you talk to the right person as in who is actually responsible for the, the kind of technical compliance isn't always the person who's responsible for signing off financial decisions and that's actually that's the same in waste producers as well um, but again I think it's just been about really trying to talk to as many people and trying to put the users at, at the heart of it and and seeing where their problems are and solving it from their perspective uh, and in terms of the tech so yeah so we um, I don't think I'm the right person to answer this but so we use the API from the Environment Agency, and then in terms of people putting on documents, um, that's at the moment that's mostly done through an onboarding process. So when we sign people up and they um, want to manage their supply chain, we onboard the documents that they have already, or and or we contact their waste supply chain contractors and ask them to add that information and to sign up. And waste companies can sign up for that for free and input that information for free. Um, so the services that are paid for are the kind of the more compliance monitoring services. Does that answer that okay? Yes, good start. And thanks very much. I've got a couple of other questions. I'll perhaps um, contact you offline because I think there's a, a few other things I'd like to follow up from other angles as well. But thanks very much indeed. Really good start. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Neil. So we have Alexa's question next. Alexa, did you want to? I can see you've you've yeah. uh, shown yourself so please ask your question um thank you sophie that was excellent i was wondering whether you've got some examples where open data standards haven't been used in a sector and that's led to real difficulties with innovation or, or any other sort of examples of where or highlighting how open data is so central to really a thriving innovative sector uh, so I think um, the waste industry is a perfect example <laughs> of an industry where it's missing and that, that and that has been overlooked and, and it's really hard to innovate in. Um, examples of where it's done well, I mean, open banking is a, is a really good example of that or, um, you know, things like, um, I mean, yeah, through the OGI, we've been involved with, the, you know, kind of seeing a few different really good examples. So Open Active is another one where, which allows people to be able to see all the kind of um, activity kind of um, things that are available to them and be able to book online and stuff like that. And I, I think it's just, it, it's, I think it's early days for a lot of this stuff, but it's, it seems to, to be where they've where they've done it, it seems to be doing well. And um, I'm certainly not a, an open data expert, but um, uh, <laughs> but I think there's, you know, to me, it's to me, I think the main thing is just about this kind of allowing people to be able to see the rules and know what the rules are and then be able to choose to, to play by those rules. Um, 
and that to me is the sort of the transformative part of it is that actually you kind of and, and by standardizing the way that people kind of talk to each other systems talk to each other it just it streamlines everything in a way that at the moment is just completely impossible certainly in the yeah. waste industry and that without open data standards i suppose you're having companies take a proprietary approach to data and not really solving the problem themselves because no one company can really solve a whole ecosystem of problems exactly yeah as in what our solution won't work for everyone and and we know that um and you know the reason we think it's really important to create the, the data standards is so that a whole plethora of people can come along and do the sorts of things we're doing because like with accounting, for example, like um, yeah. HMRCs, like making tax digital, and you can't have an accounting package that works for a sole trader and, you know, a multinational conglomerate like that. You just can't. And so how do you build systems that allow a whole load of different kind of um, software and providers to come out of it to, to let to let all of those needs be met? Basically, that's what we're trying to do. Great. Thanks. Sue. Pleasure. Thanks, Alexa. Um, Anna. Uh, would you like to ask your own question or shall I do it? Hi there, yeah, I, I can ask that. Um, th thanks for your talk, Sophie. I uh, attended one of your open data civic community workshops, which was really interesting and um, it's great to be part of the waste data community um, across the UK. Um, so you're obviously providing an excellent service to all kinds of stakeholders in the in the waste chain, the, the public businesses and and the local authorities, um, who who should be paying for this? I mean, if we want the data to stay updated and be available and accessible for years to come, you know, we don't just want this project to um, be great for a few years and then you move on to something else and uh, it, it goes out of date. Um, I mean, you're definitely helping regulators out and businesses and people um, who who can who can fund it. Yeah, good question. So I think with the with like the household waste recycling center um, data standard and data set. Um, I mean, the way that I hope that that will work and with the conversations we're having with local authorities so far, this seems to kind of fit. Um, it is around the fact that it actually makes their lives easier to do it and so um, that they'll engage with it on, on that basis. And then I think with the once, so I don't think the standard's gonna make any money ever. And I think that that's just something that will need to be supported in, in other ways. But the, um, the, the data set itself has a lot of value, I think to lots of different people, like you said. And I think for me, this is something we're exploring, but the, what would make sense is that, um, that you can access it for uh, like public or kind of, um, you know, non-commercial purposes for free or a limited amount of it for free. Whereas if you're wanting to use it for commercial purposes, that there'd, there'd be a kind of a license fee or something like that. Um, we've had some really interesting conversations with people like the um, Open Apparel Registry who are kind of dealing with the same sorts of issues, but in a completely different sector. And I think there's a lot that we can kind of learn from the ways that they're doing it and, and you know, and vice versa. I mean, they're at the moment primarily grant funded as well, but um, but in the long run, you know they're obviously trying to move away from that so i think um i i think that yeah to me it's about finding ways to for the commercial value to be kind of recognized and and you know and people pay for that and for that to kind of allow the the social good part of it i suppose to kind of to kind of be maintained and continue so it's a really waffly answer because honestly i don't know for definite yet <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Anna. Um, the next question is from Alessio. I think, um, apologies if I, if I pronounce your name wrong. Would you like to um, ask your own question or would you like me to do it? I think the silence uh, is deafening, so <laughs> I, will, I will absolutely read that out for you, Alessio. Uh, but you won't get the chance to correct my terrible pronunciation of your name, unfortunately. Um, so uh, are there also opportunities for companies, especially for the reuse of materials as raw materials? So reuse is really interesting and it's something that's come out of the workshops we've done on the household waste recycling center stuff, because at the moment we're not really solving that, but it's on our, we would like to address that um, as soon as we can. It probably won't be next year because it is, it's complicated to try and figure out how to how to kind of properly integrate that um but it is really important and it's you know for us like i said you know we 
we want to help people do the right thing with their waste and so you know actually not treating it as waste and if it's able to be reused that is a far better thing um, to happen um so that is something we definitely want to try and work on but is yeah it's not it's not there yet i'm afraid brilliant and next one uh, next question is from rabana again apologies for the pronunciation would you like to ask your own question no i'll read that out so can you imagine exporting um your idea to any other countries or is it only suitable for the uk so obviously the the bit where we use the environment agency public register is pretty uh it's not even uk specific it's england specific um but as i said like waste is a global business and in terms of the standard and stuff like that i think that that those are things that can definitely um be exported and in terms of the kind of infrastructure that we've built around um, putting on documents and, and managing those documents is something that could could happen anywhere. Um, so yeah, it is something we are definitely interested in. I ha I've been lucky enough to speak at a, a, a few different um, international events and there definitely seems to be an interest in the sorts of things we're doing in other countries. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something we're interested in. Um, but again, we haven't done it yet. <laughs> Super. And we've got a final question here um, from Deborah. So, uh, Deborah, would you like to ask your own question? Hi. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for that, Sophie. It's really, really fun. Um, I am equally frustrated by um, just members of the public and everybody I know not really understanding the questions they need to ask when uh, engaging in the way with the waste industry. Um, and I just wonder if there's room for something like the Love Food Hate Waste campaign or the Recycle Now campaign, just to say a blanket UK-wide publicity campaign saying, you know, when you speak to a skip company, ask this question, <laughs> where is it going? Do you want your envelope on the uh, dump site in Malaysia? Um, you know, just, just ask that sort of question. I just think if members of the public were subject to that kind of uh, campaign, then that would filter through to people in small businesses. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think that it's so as in it, it drives me completely insane that like every business creates waste and yet why is there not, and we all create waste individuals as well. Why is there not a campaign to kind of tell everybody what they need to do about it? I, I, I think it's probably because it costs money. I think there is definitely a business case to be made that actually, you know, that any money you spent on it would be easily um, recouped through better better interactions with the waste industry and you know a, a reduction in waste crime which yeah costs the UK economy an estimated one billion pounds a year um so I I completely yes I would love that and frankly whenever I'm around anyone who I think might be able to do it I kind of suggest it but um it's not happened yet I mean if we end up filthy rich then I would be happy to fund that ourselves but I think that's a long way off so hopefully someone else will step in in the interim and I think also the other thing, you know, it's not just about kind of doing those initial checks in terms of is the person that you're dealing with kind of, uh, you know, licensed and legitimate, but I'd really like to see the transparency of the whole supply chain, like, so that actually it's not just that person that you're dealing with, but who are they taking it on to? And, and at the moment that is lacking. Um, Depper is working on a electronic waste tracking system, which uh, will hopefully help with that. Um, but um, to me, I, I really think that, you know, that I, I kind of skipped over it a little bit, but that if we're able to shift the, the kind of where the burden of, of responsibility is from regulators to the market, you know, if we can make it easy for companies and individuals to kind of actually really ask those questions, be curious about what happens to it and, and demand answers about it rather than being fobbed off. I think that's where we can see a real kind of shift in in the need to then improve that transparency and we're seeing that in other sectors right as in that's happening in other in other areas like open app I can never say apparel correctly but those people are doing great stuff in terms of helping those you know fashion and clothing supply chains to become more transparent and I think that is exactly the sort of thing we need to do in the waste industry and use that kind of public pressure and market pressure to to force that rather than wait for regulation and legislation to do it. I think that's a really good question to, to end, end things on. So thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you so much, Sophie, for clearly sharing your passion with us. 
Um, and thanks to you, uh, everyone who's joined us today. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't use this final ODI Fridays for 2020 to thank Freya, um, who has produced our ODI Fridays for a number of years now um, and has uh, this year helped us take them online. So thanks, Freya. And um, thank you, everyone, and have a lovely end of the year. See you in 2021.